Good afternoon. I'm John Vecchioni, Senior Litigation Counsel of the New Civil Liberties Alliance. And with us today is Megan Lapp, who is, uh, uh, represents our client and is Fisheries Liaison, among other things, with Sea Freeze, Relentless Sea, Inc., and Huntress Inc. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I, uh, we're here because your clients, our clients, have a uh, case before uh, the First Circuit. Court of Appeals, New England, um, Relentless versus the U.S. Defer Department of Commerce. And um, as usual, it's an administrative law case here at New Civil Liberties Alliance, where we try to make sh sure that the administrative, administrative state stays within its bounds. Um, but in order to understand it, you have to know what they do at, uh, in, at Relentless Inc. and Huttress Inc. And, Megan's here to tell us what they do and some of the problems that have emerged from uh, improper regulation and what we've been doing about it. So, Megan, let's talk about um, the two fishing ships or fishing businesses. Um, where are they located? Um, so our two um, freezer trawlers are located in North Kingstown, Rhode Island in the port of Quonset. Um, they are about 140 feet long and they freeze at sea. That's why they're so large. Um, when we harvest the fish, we bring it up on the deck. It goes down into tanks and then down into a mezzanine level in the vessel where there's a bunch of freezers. So we freeze them into blocks um, or, or in boxes. And so then that fish goes for food. It goes for bait. Um, some of the herring that we'll be talking about today goes to aquariums, um, things like that. And uh, what, are, what are the names of the two ships? Um, the Fishing Vessel Persistence and the Fishing Vessel Relentless. All right. And um, do you only fish for herring? No, we fish for a variety of species. Um, we fish for two species of squid, elex and lalago squid. We fish for butterfish, we fish for mackerel, and we fish for herring. Got it. And um, I guess we should probably let the viewers know where is this? There, uh, there are a number of fisheries in the United States. Um, I, I think uh, some people might watch the most dangerous catch, right, up in, up, up in Alaska and the northern Pacific. That's not your fishery. What, what fishery are we talking about? Where are we? Um, well, our fishing vessels primarily fish off of the New England and Mid-Atlantic coasts. Um, the regulatory region that we are permitted for in federal waters ranges from the Canadian line off of Maine down to um, North Carolina. All right. And uh, how long have these vessels been doing this? Over 30 years. So quite a while. Quite a while, yes. All right. And um, we have... have well, What's the, how many people work on the boat on average? So on these vessels, um, they have a larger than average crew size for our area because we're freezing at sea. So it's usually about like 11 crew members um, and the captain. All right. And um, I guess what we're gonna be discussing is uh, various other people who get on the boat. Um, we, uh, I'll use onboard monitors. Um, can you tell the viewers what those are? Sure. So um, as part of being in federally permitted commercial U.S. fisheries, um, you have to take what are called observers. Um, they were originally installed to gather biological data for stock assessments, fish lines, things like that. They've become more of an enforcement mechanism in recent years. So depending on what fishery you're, you're in, there's different requirements. But for the particular fishery, we're going to be speaking about the herring fishery. You have a pre-trip notification system, you have to give the federal government, I think it's 48 hours notice before you leave the dock that you're going herring fishing. And then they have the opportunity to assign you an observer. And that is a person that comes on and monitors what you catch. They, they make sure that you're um, obeying the, the regulations and they also take biological samples. Um, and prior to the regulation we'll be discussing, uh, where do these observers come from? So they are they're actually contractors, they're observer companies, and they vie for contracts with the federal government. So typically, they're from an observer company that is contracted with the federal government, and the federal government pays for them. What's happened recently 
is that now they have created additional companies. Some of the observer companies are doing both. Then there are some additional companies that are um, providing at sea monitors, which is kind of is a person like an observer, but they don't collect biological data. They are there solely for enforcement. Okay. And uh, so biological, they're checking the fish you're catching and the fish you're throwing back, that sort of thing. That as well as they take, they'll take samples, they take measurements, weights, scale samples, otoliths, which are like kind of like an ear bone in a fish that has tree rings, essentially, like how you age a tree, that's how you age a fish, however many rings are in an otolith. So they use that kind of stuff for science. Got it. And, um, and I take it, uh, the statute says that these observers can come on the boats and you guys have to put them on your boats and have a place for them. Yeah. Right. So, uh, and that's been going on for some time. It's been right. part of the fishing industry for quite a while, at least probably since the eighties right. at least. Right. All right. And then, um, so what we're going to be talking about today is uh, something that NOAA and national marine fisheries and commerce came up with was uh, the agencies didn't like how many observers they had and Congress was funding. And they pretty much said this. They said, you know, we want more guys to put on the boats. And Congress only funded X amount of observers to go on the boats. Because does every, uh, um, every trip doesn't have an observer, I take it? No, no. How is that determined? How do they do it, do you know? So that is what the pre-trip notification system is for. Um, in the herring fishery specifically, some other fisheries are different and there's just like observers wandering the docks and they're like, hey, I'm going fishing with you today. But in herring, you give a pre-trip notification. So if you know you're going herring fishing, 48 hours beforehand, you either have to like call or do an online notification to the government to let them know I'm going herring fishing. And then, you know, you'll either be assigned an observer or you'll be given a waiver. Okay. And so the, uh, the agencies decided that they wanted more folks and they they put this in their in their proposal that we want more observers on the boats and what we're going to do since we don't have the taxing or spending power is we're going to make the fishers pay for this and they started a process um, whereby they said listen we're going to put uh, a new they didn't, they didn't call them observers. They called them at sea monitors, I think. So they, they, they made a new uh, office and they were gonna have it paid by the, um, by the industry. And uh, I'll, just, I'll just say this, there's a lot of uh, obstacles that the Congress has put up. First of all, they didn't say, Congress didn't say in the statute, you can, you can make the industry pay for these guys. So that was number one, but they also have certain rules whereby an agency isn't allowed to charge you for anything except certain costs they have, but they're not allowed to charge you to do their jobs. Like there's one miscellaneous receipts where any money they charge has to go back to the treasury, right? Any agency that's charging, uh, charging you, let, you know, let's say they have some costs that has to go to the treasury and Congress is in control of the treasury, um, or at least uh, the fisc, let's say. Um, and then there's, there's other statutes whereby Congress has said, you, any money you're getting from them has to come into the federal government. You can't use it for your own agency because they don't want the agencies running off and funding themselves and go doing things willy nilly. Um, but here uh, they are going to, uh, they did propose to have these at sea monitors uh, funded by industry. How would they be funded by industry under this proposal? So basically, there's, there's one of two ways. They have encouraged us to contract directly with the Nazi monitor provider, one of those companies that also contracts with the government. Um, or, you know, they'll just assign whoever is from whatever company is available at the time when, when you give your pre-trip notification. Um, so we have to pay that company directly for the costs incurred. And what are, uh, give the viewers some idea of what type of costs these are. What, what do they charge? And do they charge per year, per month? How, how does it work? So um, 
the estimated cost, and obviously it'll vary slightly between each company, but it's between, it's around seven, $800 a day for, for one of these individuals to be on your vessel. Um, yeah. Which is a significant charge. It's a significant charge. And I think in the regulations, it actually says that it's, it's, t it, it, it like cuts, it cuts into uh, costs or profit, like 20%. It wasn't some small number. It was like a fifth or- Right, uh, right. For our type of vessels, yes. 20% um, of your return to owner. Okay. Yep. Um, so we'll, we'll call this the final rule. We've called it that in our briefs. Um, has longer name. There's an omnibus amendment and there's the rest. But for this, we'll call it the final rule. Um, can you, so for herring, you're fishing for- I think four or five different species. Um, and so you have to know what fish you're gonna go take before you leave the dock? Yeah, so that's really what, what is one of the main problems with this particular case for our vessels. Um, the herring fishery in particular, which this rule applies to, most boats in the Northeast that go herring fishing are quote unquote herring boats. Like that's what they do. They only do herring and mackerel mixed, but like they are the herring boats. Our vessels are very different. What we do is more like multi-species fishing. So usually what we'll do, particularly in the winter time, which is when we would go harvest herring is we tell the government, okay, when we have to declare into what fisheries we're gonna do or give the government any kind of pre-trip notification, we're gonna declare into squid, we're going to declare into mackerel, butterfish, and herring, all of it. And we're going to go out. Um, the quote unquote herring boats typically are only out for like two days. Our boats are out from anywhere from like seven to 14 days because we're freezing at sea. So we don't have like a, a, a perishable product on board, right? So we have the opportunity to stay out longer. So we're going to just keep going till the boat is full. So we're going to go where we need to go. If we decide, hey, you know what, we're going to go out and try squid fishing. Maybe a storm comes up, maybe the squid disappear. You want to fill the boat on your way back with herring and you come, you know, you go, you find some herring and you finish and top off your trip with that. Then you come in, you know, we could be landing multiple species at a time. And um, as, and, but you're not, because you're freezing them, I take it you don't take as many fish per day. Correct. Correct. We have, um, we have a, a limited daily capacity because we can only freeze like about 25,000 pounds every five hours. Um, so it's the, the larger, the quote unquote herring boats that are doing it um, as a fresh product, they can do, you know, 300 to 500,000 pounds a day because they just bring it up. They put it into tanks in the vessel and then they go in and they unload it. And that's kind of their, their quick turnaround. We are not because we're freezing, we're creating a process product on board. So you have that time and that labor. Okay. And um, so uh, that's, I think we've discussed, it's a big hit. It's 20% into profitability. It's a, right. it's a huge hit to have these folks on board and charge for them. Um, and so the final rule did have some exceptions uh, to putting these paid for monitors. You'd still you'd still have to put on the monitors the government was paying for, but it had exceptions for certain vessels for, um, for these at sea monitors, this new, this new office. Um, can you tell us about those exceptions and whether they apply to your boats? Sure, so um, it, the, the rule only applies to categories A and B permits, which are the, the big herring permits. So like the little guys are not, a, are, are not subject to this. There's also a rule that if you land 50 metric tons or herring or less per trip, you're exempted. If it was 50 metric tons per day, that would help us because that's about what we can do per day. But it doesn't, you know, it doesn't help us because this is a, a per trip requirement, not a per day requirement. And I think there's also port side monitoring. There is also port side or monitoring. Dock side. Dock side. So there was dock side monitoring um, also attached to um, electronic monitoring. The, the larger quote unquote herring boats also had an option for cameras coupled with dock side monitoring um, as a substitute for the human at sea monitor. 
and that option wasn't really right. afforded to us. Um, so, and I'll just do the math here. So if I'm a herring, I'm fishing herring, I'm, and I have an at-sea monitor, I'm paying the at-sea monitor per day. So if I go out from a Rhode Island port and I take in 50 tons um, in two days, I come back to dock. I go out, I take 50 tons, I come back to dock. I go out, I do this five or six times. I could take something like 200, 250 tons of herring and I don't pay for one at sea monitor. Right. But relentless and persistence go out. They're out for 14 days. They take herring, maybe they take it a day. They take 50 and then the next day they take 25, they take 75 tons of herring. Um, and they've paid for an at sea mat monitor for all 14 days. Yes, and so really ultimately what it comes down to is on the vessels that this regulation was really designed for, they're paying for a herring at sea monitor out of herring revenue. We're gonna be paying for a herring at sea monitor out of squid revenue, butterfish revenue, other revenue, which is like really not, not the point. Yeah, it doesn't do anything for conservation of any of those species. No, no, it doesn't. And, and something else is that on the quote unquote herring boats, they really only have like, you know, like say four crew members, we have 11. And because we're, we're, we're processing. So you have the added overhead cost of having more crew members that you have to pay and all the cost of all of the freezing, all of the, you know, the fuel that that takes and, and various things of that nature, packaging and all that kind of stuff, which these other boats don't have. So it hits us particularly hard. So when this uh, regulation was coming in, this didn't come from Congress. This came, I take, from the agencies? The New England Fishery Management Council. And then it was approved by National Marine Fishery Service. Yes. Yeah. And I take it that during this process, you commented on what was happening, the, you, your companies. Yes, I commented through the entire process. I went to advisory panel meetings, committee meetings, council meetings. And when stuff went into the Federal Register, I commented but um, nobody cared. All right. Um, so you told the, the regulators about these various problems. Yes. Did you uh, say that perhaps that they should have exemptions on per day amounts of herring? Yeah. What was their yeah. response to that? They just didn't even have a response. You know, that was not the plan. We don't wanna. Right, right. Um, did, they, did they ever indicate why? Um, you're paying these, these government offices by the day, but they're, they're making you take them, they're, they're giving you exemptions per, per trip rather than per day? So I think it really comes down to the fact that these at-sea monitors were really designed for a different portion of the fishery. You know, everything was kind of set around them. A lot of the discussion was around them. Um, and, and we're not a part of that portion of the fishery. So it was really something that was geared towards a different user group that we kind of are the collateral damage for. All right, and, and uh, you've talked about you've had that uh, relentless and persistence have a different type of fishing because you, you um, the fish aren't processed ashore, right? You right. can't have the dockside monitoring because you, your ship are already, your fish are already frozen in the hold. They're not gonna take them out. Right. And then, so um, does, does this style of fishing do any more damage to the herring fishery and any other fisheries than any other, other type of fishing? No. Have, has anyone alleged that in any of these regulatory moves? No, no. It's a quota managed fishery. Like once you, you know, the, the vessel has to fill in a vessel trip report where they estimate how much fish that they caught. When they unload, the federally licensed dealer has to fill in a dealer report. And the government checks both of those two things against each other and, and things are, are pretty well monitored. Like once you hit the quota, it's done. You're close so, now. So some folks might not, uh, what, what is a, a quota monitored fishery? Explain what that is. So with the science that the government does and the information that it collects, it basically um, estimates through scientific methods how many fish are in the ocean. 
um, of that particular species. They take into account a lot of different factors, predator mortality, natural mortality, and all kinds of different, um, you know, how many fish were born this year, how many were born this year based on our surveys. And they put it all together and then they use that to say, here is a quota that you can fish on um, that is um, ecologically sustainable. So, and when you hit the number, you're closed. So this is how much fish you can catch. Go ahead and catch it. And through the, throughout the year, those reports are monitored. The government's keeping tabs in real time on how much fish is being landed. By everybody. Counting. By everybody, yes. And then once you hit it, then, then you're closed. I mean, some certain fisheries are managed a little bit differently, but they're all managed with quota. Right. So if you, on my, in my scenario I had earlier, um, if you are not taking the herring, someone else is taking the herring up to the quota, right? It doesn't save any herring. Right. All right. It just shifts who's bringing it in. Right. Okay. Right. Um, so I take it, what the industry responses to this proposal, uh, do you have a feeling of uh, how they went? Did anyone like this? Was this or was this largely uh, opposed? Um, well, it was largely opposed by us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> seriously, largely opposed by us. There were some other folks that opposed it. Um, others that weren't as hard in their in their opposition, but especially for us because it affects us so disproportionately. Um, I screamed bloody murder for however many years, years. until they approved it. <laughs> right. And then what'd you do once it was approved? You got, came and <laughs> well, got us, I right? I came and got you guys, <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. Um, yes. Uh, so, uh, so we filed suit in Rhode Island. And, I'll, uh, and we pointed out that there's the, the, the main statute is called the Magnuson-Stevenson Act that you sue under when they do something wrong. And there are certain national standards in the Magnuson-Stevenson Act that uh, the agencies are supposed to follow. One of which is don't uh, unnecessarily or disproportionately injure any segment of the fishing fleet. Any, any, uh, and, and I take it in Rhode Island, in this part of in, in North Kingston, you're the, you're the main fisher people there, right? In that port, yes. Right. Um, and so, uh, you gave uh, the agencies different options um, and they just said no. But one of the things that uh, Megan commented about a lot in, and she noted this, and I think other vessels noted this, was that there was nothing in the Magnuson-Stevenson Act that says you can charge for at-sea monitors. And this, for, for the New Civil Liberties Alliance, this is a big deal because there's various ways Congress can control the agencies. They can control them through their budget. We're gonna give you this amount of money and you're gonna do these things with it. Um, and they can, uh, that, that is you know, basically the spending power. We're gonna spend this much. We think observers are important. We're gonna put them on boats. We're gonna pay for this much of them. Uh, the agency wants more. Um, but you, uh, we were talking about this just before. What are they supposed to do if they want more observers under the, under the statute? So the statute authorizes observers that, that the government pays for. And then there's like a specific section called information collection. And they said, if you want to gather more information about a particular fishery with which to better manage it, um, if you want to monitor it more highly, if you want to have additional observer coverage, the council who manages that fishery, the Fishery Management Council can request funding from the secretary to do that and give a list of reasons like we think it's gonna be good because of X, Y, and Z. And then the secretary of commerce can approve that. Um, and I quoted this in my comments to the federal government because I was like, look, if you look at the document that the council came out with, they said that the purpose and need of this is to collect additional information and better monitor the fishery. Well, you have a whole provision in the law that is for additional information collection and to better monitor the fishery. And you're not doing that. You're just passing the cost on to us. And like, like you mentioned, John, you know, kind of like, where does it end? If I have seen a repetitive mindset in people with the agency, whether it's for science, whether it's for monitoring, 
where they're like, well, you know, if we can't fund it, you know, this is something that we'd like to do when the industry can fund it. So if, if the agency isn't held in check, you know, where does it end? If Congress says you can charge for something in only this limited circumstance and the agency is like, yeah, but we're going to charge for it in all these circumstances. Well, then eventually we're just going to be paying for all the agency. Like, you know what I mean? Like where, where does it end? They can just keep on charging you for to do their job. And that's really not. With feasible. no further congressional input. Right. And this is a, this is a problem here and, and hopefully the courts will stop it uh, because as has been pointed out uh, by you and by us, here is none of us disagree that observers can be put on the boats, right? Statute says it. Right. It's been a long time thing. No one, no one in this uh, suit that I'm aware of, and I've actually never heard of it, said no. You can't put observers on, despite the fact that it says this. And you have to, you have to absorb those costs, right? You have to have a berth for the guy. Um, you have to. Um, uh, you know, have, have room for them basically on your mm -hmm. boat. So there are costs that, that that takes in and those are the usual costs of having somebody come in. Just, just, just the same as if, you know, um, somebody's, uh, you're going out on a boat. So if you got to keep a federal guy there, it's going to cost you something, room, board, something. So um, that is not what's going on here. What's going on here is they want to put more guys on the boat so they say we can charge. So how do they get to the point where they say, um, oh, we, we, we can do this? Well, Congress didn't say you can't do it. They didn't say you shall not create a new office and not charge for it. But how is Congress, is Congress supposed to put that in every statute? It's, right. it's, it's kind of odd. You have to have the courts interpret statutes to say what they mean and not anymore. Um, and I think that's what this suit is trying to do. Um, I do, I do find it interesting. We, you've talked about one aspect of the Magnuson-Stevenson Act. It says, if you want more information, go ask the, the Secretary of Commerce to approve it, right? That's a normal congressional executive function. The Congress makes the law and, the, and then the executive gets to decide, well, should I allow this or not um, as, as an administrative matter? But there's some other things. Are you aware of other um, parts of the act or other fisheries where Congress has said you can charge industry for things? Yeah. So in the act, there are specific provisions directly um, applicable to the Pacific, um, certain fisheries in the Pacific, and you're allowed to charge um, for monitoring only if it's this type of fishery management plan and only up to a certain percentage, which is a low percentage, was it like 3% or something? of the gross revenue of the trip. So it's it's constrained. There is no such constraint here. Right, and I've looked at the statute. There's like 12 things you have to do beforehand. But in the Northern Pacific uh, fishery, Congress specifically, specifically said that, um, that you can put monitors on board and charge the industry. And they didn't say that for any other fishery, including the New England fishery. Right. So you would think that would be kind of dispositive of whether the agency has that power. But no. And, and the other thing about that fishery, and it makes sense, too, because the, the Northern Pacific fishery, if the viewers, as I always say, if you watch the deadliest catch, these are very high value, high margin fish. I always say you can't get those big crabs at Christmas time for love or money. Uh, or if you can, it's a lot of money. So so. Um, there, there are different economic factors there that Congress right. could have recommended and have a different program that they put in statutorily. How about LAPs? Could you tell the viewer what that, those are? A LAP is a limited access privilege program. It's a type of fishery management plan that basically gives individual fishing rights to individual vessels. It's kind of like an individual quota. So if if all of us here in the room were fishing boats and the quota of herring was split between us and I had 5% of the quota and you had 10% of the quota and you had 20% of the quota, you know, and you kind of, it's split up like that. Um, and you're kind of responsible for your piece of the pie in that situation, the government can charge you to pay for your own observer coverage. Right. And it's, that's capped at 3%. Right. So once again, Congress said, okay, you have to have this vote. Here are the protections for the industry, but you can charge them, but here's all this process you have to go through to do right, it. Right. Um, 
there's nothing like that for these at sea monitors, right? No. And then the last one that I know of is that foreign vessels that fish in American waters, they can be charged by the agency for the onboard monitors because they're not paying taxes. They're not, they're, they're, they come in and Congress says you can charge them. So they do directly. Um, so Congress put in lots of ways to charge the industry when it wanted to, but it didn't do this, um, right. which seems a little ano anomalous. Um, so we have, we do have um, some bad news. So we, we had this case in the district court and uh, it was out of Rhode Island, Rhode Island court, the court, the chief judge Smith there ruled on our summary judgment. We moved for summary judgment and the government moved for summary judgment and uh, the judge granted the government's uh, motion and uh, denied our motion for summary judgment and it's on appeal before the first circuit. But one of the interesting things about this is uh, Judge Smith went through all this. What we've just discussed, he went through all the ways the government has recognized to fund it. And he went through um, the fact that observers are allowed on the boats and the fact that uh, the agency said they'd done this before and Congress hadn't done anything about it, which is like, you know, you rob banks until you're caught, right? Uh, so in any event, uh, so, but that, that was their story. I mean, no one, no one stopped us, um, but, but Judge Smith said, you know, I don't know whether the statute authorizes this. Um, it seems to me that the fact that Congress has authorized all these other methods and not this one, that's very strongly on the side of uh, Sea Freeze and Relentless and Huntress. And then, uh, but on the other fact, observers are allowed on there. And there is this word, it does say that for all their goals, conservation and controlling the fisheries and all this, that they can do what's necessary and appropriate. And I don't know if that means that uh, Congress wanted them to do this. And then Judge Smith turned to our nemesis, uh, Chevron. And Chevron is the uh, judicial uh, way of uh, basically putting thumbs on the scale and saying, well, we let the agencies decide this, these ambiguous statutes. And since I think this is ambiguous, my only question is whether this interpretation is unreasonable. And he goes through it and he says, can I say it's unreasonable? I can't say it's unreasonable. So I'm gonna say necessary, appropriate, Chevron deference, power to charge you for your monitors, right? And you, are you familiar with Chevron? Yes, unfortunately. It's most of the time how we lose cases against National Marine Fishery Service. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's often how we lose against agencies uh, because what it's done is it, 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 it's, it's a doctrine that, you know, when you go into court, you think that both parties are equal, but the Chevron doctrine means that one party is more equal than other because before you went in, uh, the judge has said, I'm not going to interpret this statute the way I think is best. I'm going to let the agency interpret it. And um, whether I think it's right or wrong, if it's not completely wrong, <laughs> if it's not so wrong that I can say that this could not even be contemplated, uh, I'm going to just stamp it and put it through. So um, that is, is one of the... Uh, one of the problems in these litigations, and we are, uh, we're appealing this to the First Circuit, and we'll be talking about Chevron, I'm sure, uh, before them, and they get a lot, as all the, as all the appellate courts do nowadays. Um, thankfully, the Supreme Court has started to at least question the Chevron doc doctrine, I would say, or at least try to rein it back a little, because um, the agencies certainly don't want it reined in. They, they, uh, they, they run as, as wide as they can. Um, and it is interesting, uh, there is another case about the same statute that we have out of DC called Loper Bright. And uh, in the Loper Bright case, the judge there, so you got one judge over here uh, in DC, you got another judge in Rhode Island. Judge in Rhode Island says, this isn't clear at all. I don't know, uh, but I'm just gonna go check if it's reasonable. The judge in DC says, 
that's ah, clear. They said they could have monitors and, you know, I suppose they can charge industry for monitors. That seems clear enough. Nobody stopped them. So um, it does strike me that if, if the statute was clear, everyone would come out the same way. And I realize that's not always the greatest argument, but if, if something is clearly done by the Congress and they've said it, you don't have to argue. Like we don't argue of whether observers can be put on the boats. Um, but when something's uh, less clear, um, I think that the tie should not go, or, or not even the tie. He didn't even say it was a tie. He just said, is it reasonable? It, can, I, can I cram this into reasonability? Um, so that is not, that is not a, um, a good ground to be on. And in fact, we have little, uh, we have little judges, uh, push thumb judges that do the deferent, you push them and they, and they do a, a deference, a Chevron deference little bow. Um, they, they could get, do we, I, I don't know if we, if we can get them at the website, um, ncla.legal.org, but you know, I think they're on there. Um, as is, I should mention this, there's a video at NCLA. You can go on our website or you can go to YouTube and uh, do NCLA uh, and uh, Atlantic Fishermen and, and you'll, get, you'll get Megan uh, uh, screaming bloody murder, uh, actually, on, the, on film. So you can go take a look at that. But besides Chevron, there's also uh, something we, we, uh, we have the uh, Administrative Procedure Act which is that agencies have to do a number of things, but one of the things they have to do is not make regulations that are arbitrary and capricious um, or in violation of law otherwise. Um, and I think that here, uh, I'll, I'll ask again, can you articulate what the agency said when you said, because I think you didn't put this in your letters, wait a minute, these people could take in all kinds of herring and not have any monitors. And we're gonna have monitors all the time um, just because of the length of the trips. And why did they say that was reasonable? What, what is the, why wasn't that arbitrary and capricious? Well, and, and I think that this is where, where the facts themselves are really on our side is because, so a vessel, like say the exemption for the 50 metric tons, that is typically gonna, um, make it where smaller capacity vessels don't have to pay because they don't make as much, right? But our vessels, if, if those, if the, if the smaller vessels are doing 50 metric tons a day, but our vessels are doing 50 metric tons a day, like run the math, you know, what's the profitability of each one of these enterprises? And it's, you, you know what I mean? Like we're, we're not, we're only making, we're probably making less actually than the other guys because well now we've got to pay for monitors and we have a larger crew. So it was like they wanted to, to accommodate people with smaller fishing capabilities and they gave them a pass, but they didn't give us a pass even though that's our, the, the sea freeze vessels, that's our capacity. So it, it's really what it comes down to the numbers and, and the economics. And, and I think a lot of this, you know, I wrote a lot of very detailed comment letters and kind of like touch on your idea about Chevron. It's like fisheries regulations are very complicated. They're very nuanced and most people don't know anything about them, right? Like it's not something that you typically see in the courts. It's not something that you typically see in the news. It's not something most people are familiar with at all. So when it goes to a judge, you know, for a judge to really understand the nitty gritty of the case, they really have to do their homework. They really have to sit there and pay attention. Like Chevron just basically makes it where they don't have to. It's like, well, it's agency deference. Like they don't really have to educate themselves to the degree that they would have to if there was no such thing, you know, and it's easier to pass it off than it is to really get into the nitty gritty of these and like, well, why is this different than this? And really understand what, what's happening in the issue. Yeah, and what I always say is that there, there, there is nothing less arbitrary and capricious than math. And if you are, if you, uh, the, the national standards, one good thing about the Magnuson-Stevenson Act is it does say you've got to protect mm -hmm. the fishers, you've got to look at the communities that are going to be impacted. And uh, the sort of callous way the agency just says, well, we can't, we can't preserve every boat, we can't, you know, help everybody. But what they're supposed to do under these standards is say why and have a reasoned 
explanation for why this boat that does no more damage to the fishery, takes no more fish, does nothing different, is being treated differently. And I think that the mathematical calculations are so stark that let's yep. say even after Chevron deference, it strikes me to be arbitrary and capricious to teach, to treat a boat that, as I said, could take in 75,000 tons of herring in a two week period and another boat that could take uh, you know, mathematically 200, 250,000 tons and one has no charge and one has this very large charge of 20%. I can't figure out the reason for it. And they, and they, uh, and, and the, the, the I, I'm hoping the first circuit takes a look, look at that. Mm -hmm. um, now, one of the other issues is, and I'd like to get your reaction to this because this has some of, some of our viewers may remember that um, in uh, the uh, Sebelius case, the Supreme Court said that uh, under Obamacare, that charging everybody who didn't get health insurance, that that was beyond the commerce power, all right? So what, what they said was, is that you can't force people into a market they don't want to be in. Uh, that's really a tax. You can tax them, but you can't force them into a market. Well, this, would you be hiring at sea monitors if the government wasn't sending you over there to do it? Nope. <laughs> Ha, you, you, you wouldn't just say, huh, I think I'll just hire somebody to come watch me fish, right? No. Um, in, in any event, so there is also this argument that we have about that. Now, what the lower court said, Judge Smith said is, well, that's not the market. The market is the herring market. Um, and I, the herring market has existed without these at sea monitors for a very long time. And I don't know how they're somehow uh, you know, necessary to the market for herring. I, I, I think herring has been fished off those shores for 400 years or something with none of these guys. Right. Um, so I, I do think that there, there are some legs to that particular argument because uh, here the government is forcing you into a market you don't want to be in. Correct. Um, with uh, the cost, something about the, the other issue here is what these folks are doing. And um, so there are companies set up, I guess, in New England to go have observers, federal contractors, basically. And then also these at sea monitors. Um, are these guys fishermen? Who, who, are, who are these people who come on? What, what's the, how's it work? Well, they're typically kids straight out of college with a marine biology degree. Um, the at sea monitors actually have a lower, um, like a lower educational requirement than an observer because they're not collecting biological data. They're just basically, they're like enforcing. It's like having a cop on your boat. So a lot of them are, you know, kids right out of college. They want to get something on a resume. They're going to do this for a couple of years. So basically you have like fishermen who've been fishing for like, you know, as long as I've been alive and they're getting told what to do by, by a handful of college kids. So that doesn't always go over too well. <laughs> I can, I can imagine, but, um, what, once again, so uh, I, I think that uh, the, and, and do these folks stay in these jobs? Not typically. It used to be where there was a higher, at least in the observer program, not the at sea monitor program, but in the observer program, a much higher retention rate. Um, and it seems over time, the observer companies, and, and I will point this out, to do this, this whole regulation, they did cost analysis on us. We had to provide the council with like very detailed like business information so that they could write up an economic analysis. They never did an economic analysis on the at sea monitor companies or the observer companies. And what we have seen in the industry is that over time, the observer companies have become much more top heavy financially. So the kids coming in are not getting paid great wages. Um, they used to get paid better. Now, they get paid less. And so there's a very high turnover rate. So you're not getting people maybe who want to do this like as a career. It's kind of a very high turnover rate. So then the companies have to spend a lot of money on training. It's constantly training new people. That's one of the biggest costs of the observer program itself is training. So- And then that's passed on to you. With, with at-sea monitors, yeah. 
All right. And I, uh, uh, there's, a, there's another aspect of your boats, which I, I do want to get out a little bit because I haven't seen any response to this. Whether it's observers or at sea monitors, and, and whether how much, regardless of how many herring you're taking, um, you had a comment that it appears that more people are put on your boats. Yes. Tell us about that. So the deployment rate of observers is supposed to be, um, you know, random, right? But it's not random. In real life, nothing like that is random. So basically, all the boats are putting in for observers, and the observers are going to go on the boats that they want to go on. So our boats are bigger than most of the boats in New England. They have nice accommodations. And if you're an observer and you're supposed to have like, say, 20 sea days for the month and you come on ours, well, you just knocked out 14 of them at once. It's much easier than trying to go find a whole bunch of other boats where you're only going to go out for maybe five days or two days or whatever like that. It's easier. So they come on our boats. And I remember at some of the meetings leading up to this regulation, there was discussion how there was only 7% observer coverage in the herring fishery. And I was like, well, that's bull crap because I've got records for the past like six months that show very different numbers. So I went and I pulled them right off of our vessels. I went in the captain's log books. I went in the trip reports and I took all this stuff out. And I said, well, in the past, you know, five months or whatever the time period was, I said on, uh, on Relentless, which is the, the vessel that is on this lawsuit, we had 50% coverage. And the observer um, coordinator for National Marine Fishery Service she about had a heart attack in her chair because she knew what was going on. The government knows what's going on. They know how these observers are deployed. They know that it's not random. Um, and, and those numbers just proved it. And then she had to kind of like try to backpedal. Um, what was the comment? I haven't seen any explanation for this in their response. They just say, uh, <laughs> I mean, they don't, they say, ah, we don't think it's happening, but they don't point to any counter statistics no and there's actually statistics that show at large i remember a different in a different fishery there was a statistical analysis done and it was very clear like how come some boats are picked pretty frequently and others are never picked you know what i mean like statistically that doesn't happen um it's one of the kind of um you know ignore the man behind the curtain kind of things of the federal government. And um, it's certainly something that if we had um, different control of the house right now, I'd like to have a, an inquiry into that. I'd like to, I'd like to have a hearing. <laughs> so but what's happened, what's gone on here is, so um, you have a statute that's supposed to protect fishers and the fish. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a sure. statute, it's kind of a balanced statute when you read it. It's right. not like, it's right. not over top heavy. It's not like right. the agency can say, well, Congress made this decision. Right. It, it, basically says protect the fish, but also make sure fishermen can operate. And, and uh, I'm boiling down a very long statute, but it, it does, uh, it, it seems to be a process of congressional negotiation to how they got this. Um, so it doesn't say they can charge you. Then they decide to charge you and you put in these comments and you say, well, your math doesn't work. Um, other ships are gonna take more herring and, um, not have observers and they don't really respond to that they don't really respond to that fact that i know it's supposed to be random but it's not random this is uh you know this is this is like the casino in casablanca where they can stop the roulette table where they want and it always seems to land on relentless and huntress um and uh, again the response is kind of not there uh and so i'm I, i'm just wondering um how long, how long do you think you put in these various comments? How long did this process go on where you put in these comments and you didn't get any, uh, what you believe is a reasoned response? I mean, did it happen in over a year? Or? It was multiple years. Gosh, I don't know, three years maybe. All right. So you had long enough to take a look and see if this was still happening. Right. And it was still happening. Um, so I'll just get back to the... Uh, I want to get back to the lawsuit for a second. Um, we have uh, in, uh, you have the New England, the First Circuit covers New England fisheries and 
and strangely enough, uh, Puerto, Puerto Rico. <laughs> and so they have fisheries off there too. So there are a number of, you were saying earlier that no one has these cases. I said, ah, I think the first circuit has these cases. <laughs> they do have, they do have a lot of, do. a lot of fish cases. They do. In, <laughs> they do. It's always first circuit. Yes. <laughs> so um, I hope they'll look at this and they'll, they'll look at exactly um, how it works. I, I, I saw a, um, uh, a case the other day that they called the herring the silver beauties of the sea in one of these first circuit cases and i was wondering i didn't know where that came from but um but i do think that uh, hopefully the first circuit has enough knowledge about how this works and how it's supposed to work um that we that we can get them to look at it closely and uh i do hope also that judge smith's statement that the, admin the administrative agency saying that this is clear is uh, is not correct will have some effect and perhaps um, the recent turn against chevron will will also have some effect because it's particularly it's particularly interesting as you've said the agency has its own internal i don't know drives to to do whatever it wants rather than what congress wants or what's good for the fishermen or any of that stuff um, and if they're allowed to have Chevron deference to how much power they have, that's even worse because it's not a matter of, uh, uh, let's say there's a quota number. Let's say the quota could be 150,000 uh, pounds of fish per month, and, or it could be 75. Um, Congress probably can't make that judgment. <laughs> it's gotta be, right? But that's not what they're doing. They're not, they're not saying, well, maybe it's not clear, but we've got to make that judgment on scientific grounds. They're not using any of their, um, they're not using any of their expertise on the fisheries. They're just saying we can do this because we want to do this. Right, right. It's kind of like, you know, when I explain it to people, a lot of the time I tell them, you know, enforcement of law and regulations, that's a government's job. The government's supposed to be law enforcement. Like that's their job. It's not my job. It's their job. And, you know, nobody pays for a police force directly out of pocket. You pay through your taxes. Your taxes go to the government, whether it's like local or whatever, and they take that money and they fund the police force. This is akin to saying, okay, well, we're still going to tax you at the same rate, but also you also have to pay for a police officer in your job. You're going to pay for his salary directly. And eventually, if his salary it makes it too expensive. He, he has to go with you uh, on, on your trip back and forth from work. <laughs> but eventually, if his salary is too expensive for you to pay directly because you're not making that much at work, guess what? Now you don't go to work. Correct. And, and that's, that's really ultimately where this kind of thing can end up. And that will hurt North Kingston and all the rest of it. And, and I will actually, there was a case out of Alabama where the police force was pulling everybody over and charging everybody for everything, every, every single um, fine they could, they could put in. And it turns out this town was getting 60% of its revenue from the police. And then it were, they were giving most of that revenue to the police. And it was, a, it was a big, the story went national and everyone was outraged. They were absolutely outraged. How could they possibly do this? Well, that is what NOAA and National Fisheries and Commerce are doing here. They don't like the amount of state troopers that the government was willing to send out. So they're having you pay for the state trooper who's following you back and forth from work. And um, I wanna impress here, you know, everybody, all my clients in the, in the fisheries industry and certainly um, Sea Freeze, and Relentless and Huntress, they want there to be fish, perfectly fine to have observers on there, whether there's a culture clash or not, look, the law says it, there's there for a purpose. We all know what the reason is. Right. So we're gonna go ahead and do it. But this mission creep whereby they are going to exert a power and assert a power that's not in the statute and then uh, have no limits on it. Because that's the other thing. The, the fact is, it is one of those things we say at uh, NCLA is whether you, no matter who's in Congress, no matter who's um, making the laws, Everybody, the, the Congress has taken into account this back and forth between conservation and industry, and they put it in the statute. And when they charged industry, they put these caps and these protections. And the agencies had none of those incentives. 
They didn't have, you know, so if, if Megan Lapp yells bloody murder at them, what's she going to do the administrative agency, right? You can't, you can't vote them out. Right. You can't, you can't go right. and, and go and, and, and get them out of office. And so that is, is what's the incentives for the administrative state to grow yes. are really huge if the courts don't rein it in and say, look, Congress gave you a huge amount of power. They gave you all this power over the seas. They gave you all the power over the fish. They, they said, you know, necessary and appropriate, which um, all the courts say is broad language. But do they have to then get all this power from Congress, all this language, and then the little, and then if we weren't clear, you can do what you want. Un unless you you've absolutely just um, just uh, almost violated the statute. I mean that is not a fair uh, set of circumstances. Um, so uh, we'll see what happens. We'll uh, we'll be filing very shortly. And uh, in the Loper Bright case, I also anyone who's interested in this, you can watch that as well. That will they they I think they're going to argue before the D.C. Circuit uh, this month, maybe February eighth. But um, I think it's an I think it's uh, an interesting circumstance. The First Circuit has struck down some rules by NOAA and National Fisheries uh, under the national standards and for arbitrary and capricious before. It's not unheard of. So um, we do hope that it uh, that it occurs in this case. Um, and I think do you anything else you want to sum up to the audience before we go to questions? No, I think that was a pretty good we summary. Covered all the uh, we covered all the bases. Well, I think that um, here at New Civil Liberties Alliance, we are hoping, um, obviously, to uh, win on anything. Uh, any of the statutes, I haven't even brought up the, uh, uh, the, the RFA, but um, the Regulatory Fairness Act, but uh, I do think that it, it's always good to win, but boy, that's Chevron business. Uh, it's it's really teed up here, and it's really a re it's it's a uh, a repeat offender uh, in the in the uh, administrative law area, and it has it has been the uh, I think the way you put it was very good that the courts can use it as a crutch to not do the real work, and I I have to say I, I do think that the Supreme Court has basically said that don't use it as a crutch do all the work do all the work possible before you you reach for Chevron, um, and so. Uh, I do hope, uh, I hope we win, and I hope we win on Chevron. So I think we have time for questions. Jen? You guys mentioned there are you know, some explicit limits on other district kind of fishing powers, the lab programs, the percent, some limits on foreign uh, vessels. Um, has the agency proposed any limits that it could uh, could, uh, would, would apply in this instance or have the court engaged that issue? The, the courts have seemed lively unconcerned with the costs. Even though the national standards say that they have to take these into account, they say, yeah, they took them into account, but they said it'd be 20%. So yeah, they took them into account, but 20% is huge. As I always say, you know, the, the, in, in, in the beloved Christmas movie, Die Hard, you'll remember that Hans Gruber was absolutely over the moon that he was going to be put his bearer bonds in at 20 percent you know and that was like a huge amount of money even for the villain in die hard but here they all go oh it's fine you know it's just going to be a 20 percent hit on a, a, a business without huge margins i mean this is it's really something so uh the agency basic the the agency and the courts have avoided this issue um that and, and I haven't even seen, I've read Loper Bright, I've read Judge uh, Smith's opinion, um, where he does go through an awful lot of facts, but they don't ever grapple with why it's reasonable, as far as Congress is concerned, to have a 3% cap, or in, in um, Alaska, it's, it's like below half of what it, what it costs in the New England fisheries for this regulation when it's allowed by statute. And you have protections, you can do certain things to challenge uh, it. Um, but the judiciary has seemed um, unconcerned with this sort of thing. And, and I certainly think that in the analysis of reasonableness, whether something's reasonable, reasonable, you should take the yardstick that Congress laid out. 
if Congress has put in a 3% cap when it allows these type of charges, or if it, when it's allowed it, the actual um, cost is half of what the agency does when it's just off on its own wild hair, um, I think that should go into the reasonableness analysis. And I, and I, it has not yet. Rich? I'm always concerned that uh, some, some uh, companies have better lobbyists than others. When you talk about the, uh, the herring boats seem to have much lower rates. Um, I often not, don't think that's a coincidence that they obviously were able to get it through the agency and get exceptions made for them that would not have been available to everybody. Just wondering, uh, first of all, is there any evidence at all that they got their uh, exemption uh, because of some special favoritism from the agency? Because obviously that puts you at a competitive disadvantage. And other than the suggesting to the court that this somehow makes the uh, regulation arbitrary and capricious, is there anything in our case that suggests that, that this is actually a some respects I will not I will not say that that has been in the case but the way the the boards work <laughs> who's on the national fishery councils because you have industry people on those councils right and it may be that there are herring people on there and and there's something else that that is also one of those nuanced things that is important for judges to understand which I don't think that the judges probably pay attention to is the fact that the way um, observer coverage is allocated, um, like the, the ones that the feds pay for, it is allocated not by fishery, but by gear type. So the gear type of our boats is called small mesh bottom trawl. We have a higher rate of observer coverage anyway like just base observer coverage that the government pays for. And the quote unquote herring boats, they are midwater trawlers and they have a different coverage rate. Their coverage rate is lower. So in the discussion, when this all was going down at the Fishery Management Council, all of the discussion focused on midwater trawls and the fact that they didn't have a higher coverage rate of normal observers. And I'm going, um, we do, we do, we do. Can you leave us alone? Can you give us an exemption? Like if your issue is that they don't have a high enough observer coverage rate for what you want, well then make this applicable to the midwater trawl vessels. Don't put it on the small mesh bottom trawl guys. We already have higher coverage rates. And our coverage rates already give you the scientific satisfaction that you're looking for out of this whole action. Um, and you, I think what Megan's saying also, it should be noted, they're the only freeze boats I know of in operating. So that is another aspect of this. But I, I think this is, we do have in our briefs, these three different, um, the three different types of uh, trawl and that they've been treated somewhat differently. They've been treated differently. And now all of a sudden they want to treat us the same because it's politically expedient. Um, and that's a problem because it smashes us to pieces. Whereas other people, it doesn't affect them as much. So we have a question from uh, one of our online viewers. It's actually uh, purposely mentioned that, uh, and it's, it overlaps with what uh, Rich just asked. Uh, it's a multi-part. They want to know whether there is any, any aspect of guys are being punished because you're innovators because the, because of your freezing technology that allows you to operate differently and, and more efficiently if, if not for this then maybe some of these other uh, other herring boats um is there any sense that that, that you're being punished for that this is an anti, not just anti-competitive but anti-innovative that you're being punished for finding a new way that not to take any more fish but to take them more efficiently fewer fewer trips more uh, longer trips Etc. Is there any sense of that? Um, yes, in the sense that we're we're the only people that fish like we do, but we're only two boats. So when it comes to the management regime, they don't want to make exceptions for just two boats, right? They don't want to have to deal with issues that are only specific to just two boats. So they're just going to make a blanket rule. Um, 
you know, they're gonna, of course, around the council tables, um, there's always, it's like Congress, there's always horse trading going on, right? But they, they would rather just make a blanket rule. They don't wanna deal with, hey, wait a second, there's these two boats over here that are different. How do we deal with them? They don't, they don't wanna go there. They just wanna be like, okay, here's your reg. Have a nice day. And, I, and so the Regulatory Flexibility Act has, is supposed to address this a little bit, but it has, much, its teeth are much smaller than the other regulatory uh, uh, protections you have. But it's supposed to be for small businesses like this, and all of these, these, uh, uh, they all, they're all small businesses. We've talked about bigger and smaller, but all these, all these fishing boats are small businesses under the law, without question. They're not; these aren't big operations, and um, you're, they're supposed to take it into account. But it does seem that with Chevron, and and with the way the statute's written, that uh, innovation is stamped down by the, just the operation of what Megan's talking about. They don't want diversity because the administrative agencies have a problem with diversity of how you do things. And so they're, 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 um, they're internally hostile to diversity, but I don't think that they're like, oh, that's something new, I wanna stamp it down. It's more like, that's not what I'm used to, therefore I'm not going to address the problems that are being brought up by all of these comments. Right. And so it, it is more, it is less than, it, it, it is not so much, as far as I can see from the, com from the comments and what they do back, sort of a malicious mindset, it's an indifferent mindset. It's, mm -hmm. it's just plain old, yep. I'm an administrator, I wanna put all the, I wanna put the ostrich eggs and the, and the chicken eggs and the emu eggs and the duck eggs and the goose eggs all in the same box. And if this one doesn't fit, whoosh, ah, good fit in the box. And, and that is kind of their, that is kind of what they're trying to do here. And I think that the Magnuson Stevenson Act and the RFA are, are saying, don't do that. They, they seem to say, don't do that. But the agencies go ahead and do it. Oftentimes, just as Supreme Court sometimes says, I have to give them their due. They say, look, go through all the statutory analysis before you get to Chevron. And the district courts do sometimes take a shortcut and say, seems ambiguous, looks reasonable. Got that one off my docket. So um, I, I think that this one, rather than being uh, some you know, evil mustache twirler in the, in the administrative state, I think this is more just the way the Leviathan moves crushing things that don't fit its model. Uh, so I have another question. Uh, this one comes in from Kara. Uh, and she, so she wants to know, are we seeing the Magnuson-Stevens Act, are we seeing the actions of the agency actually diverge from the original purposes of the act in, 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 all, in this new compliance regime, moving away from biological data collection, starting to, uh, starting to pass on the costs of surveillance? And she wants to know if, if that's true, if, if that is what's happening, what, what can be done to realign the agency's uh, priorities and its actions with the stated goals of Magnuson uh, Stevens. So Kara Rollins is uh, with me on this case. Uh, she has she was with us below, um, and uh, so that's a good question. I'll let Megan handle it first. Well, um, when observers themselves first came on board years ago, they were created supposedly at the beginning for biological data collection. This was supposed to help science. This was supposed to help fisheries be better managed because if you had better science, you could better manage fisheries, right? That, that's not an issue. What happened over time is that they became more and more of an enforcement mechanism um, where you know, observers now are not just collecting data, you know, they're, they're trying to look in and watch your operations and make sure that you're obeying the regulations. Whereas now you get down to the road of at sea monitors and the creation of this new office, at sea monitors don't do biological data collection. They only do enforcement. So you've seen it kind of go from, hey, let's do science to more of a police state. That, that's kind of been the progression over time. Um, and, and that's an issue. And what does the act say in terms of its stated goals of, oh. of science versus so, police state coercion? So what it, says, what it says is, is that every action that the agency takes 
has to meet these 10, these 10, uh, 12, excuse me, 12 national standards. And there is some tension between them because, and this, this is where the agencies run rampant. It's because the national standards are, uh, I think of eight all the time because we use it all the time. It's the, 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 the impact has to be minimized on the fishers where practicable, right? Well, it seems to me everything that Megan offered and said that they should do was practicable. Every, every uh, alternative was practicable. It wouldn't hurt anybody, wouldn't have, wouldn't have hurt fish collection, wouldn't have hurt the um, quotas that, because the, the one thing about a quota regime is um, you, you don't go over it. The quotas, whatever they're set for that year, you're not going to go much over it because you're monitoring it per trip and, and, you're, and you're making sure that it's, I mean, it might go over by, you know, 500 fish or whatever it is, but it's not going to go over by a lot to hurt the whole, whole place or it's going to be under by a little bit. But it's by and large, um, they know how many fish can be taken. It's going to be taken by somebody. So they shouldn't care so much and, and burden one group more unless they had a rational reason. It would be different if the agency had said, well, your type of fishing, you know, it's causing all this wreckage of bycatch, right? All these fish that you don't take are being injured. So your type of fishing is bad. They haven't said that. The record's clear that ours is, our type of fishing probably takes less, probably does less damage. So it's not the case. And I can't, and the reason I'm sensitive about this is because every time we do a brief with the government, the government always starts out, you know, all the fish in the sea are ours, right? And, and we have to protect all the fish in the sea. And, you know, you can, you can hear the little mermaid singing in the background. And I, I think that, I think that, uh, I, I think that they're always trying to get the courts to think that somehow that if you don't listen to the agency, you know, all the fish are going to dry up, but that's not what's going on here. There's not, there's zero impact on the herring from letting uh, it be per day, <laughs> having the exemptions per day or having, because it aligns, it's also, and, and, and this does, this is uh, so arbitrary and capricious. You have the exemptions per trip but the monitors are paid per day and the, the fishermen fish a certain amount of days, you know, they don't care how long their trips are. I mean, we don't care if we, if we somehow got our fish earlier, we'd come back. If, if, if the other fish, if they have to stay out longer to get their amount of fish, they come back. Nobody really cares about trips in the fishing business. This is not like, like you're, you're going out on a charter boat and they, the charter boats is per trip. They go out for six hours a day. They say, we're going on this trip and they come back and it's a per trip industry kind of. Um, but that is not how the commercial fishing industry works. So you have a complete mismatch. The administrative state has made a complete mismatch in the economic um, uh, standards that everyone uses. The herring fisher, fisheries, our clients who, who fish a number of fish, they all don't care about how long their trips are. They care about getting the fish in whatever amount of time it takes to get them. So in any event, so that's, that's where I think we are. Um, are there any further questions? Well, I'd like to thank Megan for coming down here. I was hoping we'd get better weather than you have in New England, but I don't think we've done that this time in DC. So I do appreciate you coming down here, but at least you didn't have to bring different clothing. That's true. <laughs> And uh, I thank, thank you all for being here. And I also want to thank our viewers um, out on Zoom. And so for the New Civil Liberties Alliance, I'm John Vecchioni. Thank you for attending.